on October 14th, 2003, 15 and a half years ago, I stood in this very spot and declared usability ROI a myth. <coughs> um, it was followed by a very controversial uh, article in Interactions Magazine, which I still get mail about at least once a quarter. <laughs> Mostly favorable, some um, not so. So one of the things that having almost 40 years in practice and having run some very large global UX teams, and now being a professor, um, is you get to complain about a lot of things and, and have some perspective. I came to this topic on deintellectualization actually through um, uh, IDSA and some work I was doing with them on education. So instead of trying to um, dance around the first slide, <clears throat> let me kind of explain what the definition is. Now the Urban Dictionary is one of my favorite sources and it basically it's pretty clear if you've read this already because you can read faster than I can talk that somebody should come and just whack me over the head with a baseball bat right now and we can end the presentation. <clears throat> It's not a word I made up. <clears throat> From the Oxford Dictionary of Economics, um, it is the process of dumbing down in education and society um, and the focus shifting from qualitative to quantitative um, analyses. And of course, the, the economists are always kind of irritated by the business school people. So this last line, the substitution of management speak for reasonable discourse and analysis. I think that we are at a pivotal time in UX uh, as a profession where the plurality of education options and the multiple entry points into the practice are so diverse that <coughs> um, we are kind of losing our identity in our way and we're also seeing some generational differences where people um, really don't understand um, a lot of the history of HCI, for example. And so I got on this rant. Now, <clears throat> there are actually two kind of intertwined themes to this. Um, I figured I should pick apart another myth while I'm here, just for memory's sake, because I think the last couple times I've been here was to hear Jeff speak, actually, not to, for me. Um, but this is actually kind of an example of the deintellectualization. So I'm going to take apart um, what I perceive to be some of the nonsense in the profession and lack of understanding of fundamental knowledge. Um, and then we'll flow into this um, deintellectualization. But basically, consider the myth to be the symptom at this point in time, and we'll close on the disease and the antidote a little bit later. As many of you know, I was head of UX for Oracle for 11 years and for SAP for seven. So I have lived in this enterprise um, space, and I put the enterprise in quotes. But one of the fundamental questions, really, when you're trying to do UX, and when I was at Oracle, I was hired, I was the first UX person, period, um, and kind of had to build that from scratch. Um, but is it really a meaningful distinction when it comes to design? And I want to pull this apart. So first I'm going to do it by analogy. Okay? So we have the lion. Is the lion the enterprise version of the pussycat? So their DNA is very, very similar. It's only a couple of uh, strands different. Okay? But is size actually a distinction? that would make a difference in terms of user experience and delivering quality and meeting user goals? I don't think so. Okay, so it didn't work for cats. Does it work for dogs? Is the German Shepherd the enterprise version and the poodle the consumer version? Well, obviously rhetorically it isn't, but let's say we upgrade the dog. <laughs> so now the dog is a police dog. Okay, so he has a service function. Is the police dog the enterprise version of the poodle? I don't think so. There are no biological analogies that work for this distinction between enterprise and consumer. 
And I think we all know that the users of products that are so branded um, themselves have the same DNA, and they use and intermix on a minute-by-minute -minute basis um, tools for work and tools for personal use. So then you can say, well, what about platforms? Well, you can say Facebook is a consumer platform. Oracle is certainly an enterprise platform. Is that a meaningful distinction? Is Facebook any less complex than Oracle? I don't think so. I don't think you can compare the complexity and say there's a difference between having two billion users online and running all of the stock exchanges in the world. So that's not a good way to look at it. So then you can say, well, is there an emotional distinction that, you know, and I, I would say here you can create the tag cloud for consumer and everybody would say, well, it's fashionable, it's cool, it's social, it's a waste of time, whatever it is. So there's a perception that consumer would be cooler, right? And then if you built the equivalent tag cloud for enterprise, is it, you know, cool isn't the operative word. <laughs> it's going to be reliable maybe, but it's also heavily social these days. But still, this doesn't do anything for me as a designer. I'm trying to figure out what it is I need to do to meet the needs of a population of users. So then I want to dig in a little bit deeper into the economics of this. <clears throat> All right, is there an economic difference between enterprise and consumer? Here, there probably is to a slight extent. So if you were to look at the economics of consumer, particularly in the hardware world, because of Moore's law, we would see this decline um, in cost over time. And, if, and so you could look at that and say, well, that's the kind of the price drop of TVs or VCRs or whatever. If you looked at the economics that people would talk about for enterprise companies, let's say in Oracle to start out with, they kind of flatline. In spite of Moore's law, they continue to make equal or more money. They're simply not trapped in this gravity of the chip industry and Moore's law. But if you actually look economically, um, take the Wall Street view, Oracle and SAP really have about the same profitability level as Facebook and LinkedIn. In fact, maybe they, Facebook and LinkedIn have a higher degree of profitability which basically, if you look at the, the numbers, and it varies a little bit, is every 80 cents of every dollar is profit. Ask an auto manufacturer what their, their margin is, or a grocery store, okay? 5%, yeah, if you're lucky. <laughs> okay, so to me, I think, and I'm gonna show you um, that at least as we have to practice user experience in both research and design, the answer to this question is no. This is not a rational or, or valid um, way to take a look at the world of product design. And to me, again, it's, it's a symptom of the overall disease of not really understanding the macro context in which we have to operate as a profession. If you go and you reframe this as a design strategy question, um, and I won't go into sort of my kind of philosophy on design strategy, but I can point you to an article I wrote about it. Um, the product design world looks like this, or the design world, I should say, in general. There are two classes of products, or two classes of design problems, to be more accurate. I have to be careful in my choice of words here. A product is something where partial implementation yields partial value, right? Twitter is a product, according to an economist. WordPress is a product. It doesn't have to do much, but if it does something of value, it can have a significant amount of gaps and deficiencies um, and still be financially viable. A solution is where you have to do the full system implementation to get any value. You cannot make 
an aircraft that doesn't land safely, or you get in a lot of trouble. And we've had like these two instances with the uh, 737 MAX 8, um, one this week. Tax software cannot do half a tax return, right? You've got to do the whole job or you've got nothing. There's quite a lot of other examples for this, and we're going to talk a little bit about space travel in a minute, and that's another example. When people use the word service, service is orthogonal to the concept of product and solution. A service is a, when there's a combination of human actors and technology paired together. So yes, Uber is a service, right? It requires some software, it requires a car, it requires a driver. If the, you get an Uber driver and the whole car smells like marijuana, you're not going to have a very good experience. Okay? But there are human actors in all of this. Airbnb has human actors. Even Zipcar, which you would think of as, as a service, is not a product as much as a solution because if the person who has the Zipcar before you've reserved it doesn't bring it back, you're screwed. Right? So there are human actors. Um, and human actors add complexity, but it doesn't uh, alter this distinction between partial implementation yielding value and the entire end-to-end -end thing has to be delivered or you have no value. Orthogonal to this, and this is where some of the enterprise noise, I think, comes into it, is the business model um, actually is kind of, again, independent of product or solution. You could be on the advertising continuum. Um, you could be at the subscription enterprise license SaaS. You could be fee-for-service. Again, this is another variant that designers have to understand and respond to, but it doesn't change the fundamental dichotomy between products and solutions. It will change some of the design characteristics um, and choices that you would want to make in terms of selection of archetypes and patterns, flow design, what the conceptual model might look like, et cetera. Okay. An example of a solution, cancer treatment, the air traffic control system, the ATM system, the power grid. They have a very simple characteristic. Um, for the most part, we sometimes don't notice them, but these solutions are the global infrastructure that we have come to depend on to the extent that it feels magical until it fails. When it fails, there are serious consequences. When products fail, there are annoying consequences, but nobody should die. Mistaking the two, which is an example I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> um, can really cause some serious problems. Now, I understand, I, I didn't plan it this way, but on the, on the radio in the car here, I believe today is the anniversary of the first, first lunar landing. That was on the radio. OK? This is a solutions problem, right? And my students will, I apologize for repeating this, but if you're going to send a man to the moon, the most important thing is not the rocket fuel. The most important thing is you got to get him back. If you don't get the astronaut back alive, you get no credit. The mission is a failure, OK? Clearly a solutions problem. Now, interestingly, about a month ago in our foremost ACM general publication, ACM Communications, there was a wonderful article by uh, Thomas Haig criticizing Silicon Valley very legitimately on the use of the word moonshot. The Apollo landing was the largest waterfall project in the history of mankind. With the most number of dependencies, there was no MVP. There was no try it and see whether it fails. It was an all or nothing waterfall project. It would, according to this article, by today's dollars, have been a multi-trillion dollar investment to pull this off. It used the most conservative, oldest, reliable technology possible, right? There was no part that went in there that people 
um, didn't have some idea of its reliability profile and, and the degree of failure possibility. I recommend this article, but um, the general idea of the way we do things in Silicon Valley is completely antithetical to the historical context of the moonshot. And I'm going to come back to that later. <clears throat> going on just a little bit further, global positioning systems. That's a solution, OK? It involves lots of satellites. Effectively, you, lose a, you need to triangulate three satellites to get a signal. The Find My Car app, which is actually one of my favorites, because I have a tendency to lose cars in parking lots, is a product. One of the things that differentiates this as a product and you'll see this with all of these so-called car finders, including the ones that come from the manufacturer, is they can't deal with vertical parking lots. They cannot tell you where your car is. Now, that is a technical oversight because the GPS signal is three-dimensional. It's used in avionics to calculate um, a, uh, altitude. So the data is actually there. I don't know if it's a licensing issue with the phone vendors or whomever, but you can absolutely know within a couple of feet the elevation based on triangulating three GPS signals. I've been in a private planes, um, private plane that a friend of mine owns with modern electronics, and it basically doesn't um, use a traditional altimeter. <clears throat> LinkedIn, it's a product, right? <clears throat> Has a very narrow niche does a pretty good job. Hopefully, some of you probably found out about this on LinkedIn. Take something that might look like a product. Uh, so diabetes um, is an area where I've done a lot of consulting in. Um, product or solution? Well, the product on the left, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later, I'm going to argue is a solution. Um, this is the Blue Star product from Wellbach. And it is a class two medical device prescribed by your doctor, paid for by your insurance. Legally, it's a pharmaceutical. It has a drug code. So when, and there's no hardware involved. So we'll talk about the software. BANT, on the other hand, is a very, I think, nicely designed uh, blood glucose tracker. But that's all it does. It can't dose insulin. It can't give you advice on lifestyle exercise, sleep, right? Obviously, it's not under FDA control. So when you look at things, you'll see that size doesn't necessarily matter. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, Blue Star is the first instance of digital medicine. I don't think it'll be the last. In clinical trials, and it's been through several in the United States and Canada, this particular machine learning I hate to say AI, but <clears throat> that's kind of in vogue, um, is it can tell you what to do. Um, it has been shown to reduce the um, A1C level of high-risk type 2 diabetics by two points. Medformin, the most popular drug for type 2 diabetes, which I believe, um, don't quote me, it either works on your liver or your kidneys, um, is um, able to, on average, reduce by 1.8. So this is significant, that behavioral uh, psychology and some software can actually get you to outperform a drug with no med interactions. So it's kind of a no-brainer for an endocrinologist to prescribe it. And I'm really not kidding that it is by prescription. <laughs> you have to get it renewed by your doctor every 90 days, and you have to get it refilled every year by your doctor in order to continue to use it. If you don't use it, the insurance company doesn't have to pay. So that is a solution. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to basically correct one of my previous slides. I made this comment on economics to kind of make a point. Um, but actually, since I was talking enterprise consumer, if you really look at solutions, what happens is it really looks like this. <clears throat> There is a price compression due not to Moore's law, I'll explain why, for solutions over time. They do ratchet down. They don't come down slowly. They come down on a stair function economically. 
and they come down because of disruptions. So this is all the what, Clayton Christensen <coughs> theory, right? When there's a platform change, um, open source, any of these things that disturb the um, ecosystem can have the ability to push down in a step function the actual cost to the consumer or consuming business, the uh, operative cost of the solution. <coughs> so now that I've basically broken the world into the distinction between solutions and products, <coughs> which I think is a more um, rigorous way to look at this, <coughs> would you use the same interaction design approach for these two classes of products? How many would say yes? Let's take a poll. Raise your hand and say yes. How many of you would say no? OK, good. <coughs> <coughs> Solutions require a more rigorous approach. It needs to be guided by UX history, by design theory, by cognitive science. Products are more amenable to being created via intuition and, and rapid iteration. Obviously, because the risk is lower. I would argue that designing products would still benefit from a more rigorous design pedagogy. And at least the way I teach um, my uh, two graduate level classes in interaction design at San Jose State, we assume the rigorous pedagogy irrespective of what we're doing and maybe because we're an industrial engineering program, um, everybody can do math. <clears throat> when you do apply the product design process to a solution, um, you do get in trouble. But the interesting point that I want to make here <clears throat> is as a practitioner, and particularly those who are consultants or managers in UX, when you get into a situation where you have a CEO and you're in a non-regulated industry, they generally would not understand the difference. So it becomes hard to push for a more scientific and rigorous approach to UX. You won't have that problem in a medical products company. Right? The CEO understands we are regulated by the FDA. We do anything really bad, and our products can be pulled off the market, irrespective of <clears throat> how positive our overall legacy is. An interesting example of a mistake, an early mistake, was Nest, which um, in 2014 decided to push an update to all their thermometers uh, in the country, and the temperature was approximately 20 below in Chicago. And it crashed. Um, I don't know if you can read the bottom part, if you guys can see the quote from the unhappy person. Right, my nest is freaking out, won't go online, keeps saying the battery is dead, keeps rebooting, heat not working, and I'm freezing my balls off. If I throw a $10 thermostat back on, which hopefully he kept his old thermostat, right? Okay, pipes are freezing. People can die. This is a very classic example of not knowing the difference. In a case like this for home automation, this is a, it requires a solution approach in terms of rigor, in engineering, and in design, which was obviously not there. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let's move on. So again, if we can toss this, um, what I consider to be artificial distinction between what's needed from a UX perspective to do a good job in consumer versus in um, this mythical enterprise <clears throat> land, <clears throat> What it, do I have to say about deintellectualization? Where am I going with this kind of silly title of this talk? <clears throat> well, solutions clearly require a more rigorous approach. But what do I mean by rigorous? And so <clears throat> I'm going to, if you let me indulge um, in a mini course, <clears throat> just five short topics to illustrate. <clears throat> A lesson from cognitive science on the impact of grammar on memory load 
based upon a book that Jeff Johnson wrote and published in 2011 on conceptual models. Um, all of my students have been forced to read and been uh, tested on this book. If you're not familiar with it, you should go tonight and buy a copy. The main issue is <clears throat> the symmetry of the grammar, which is used to express the designer's idealized model, matters in terms of cognitive load. This is an example from traditional GUI word processor, where the actions are cut, copy, paste, and the objects that people deal with in the canvas area tend to be characters and words, et cetera. If you are sloppy, all right, and I had to design and redesign WordPerfect and Multimate in the course of my career some 30 years ago, which were essentially pedigree DOS word processors with bizarre key combinations and very unsymmetric grammar um, in terms of the commands and how they apply to objects, you get this sparse matrix effect. <clears throat> and the implication of the difference between these two is staggering when it comes to human memory. <clears throat> if you can have a tight grammar without a lot of exceptions and differences, and you'll never have a perfectly symmetric world like this, um, <clears throat> but essentially complexity modulo a few coefficients um, grows as the number of objects plus the number of actions. If you get sloppy, it starts to grow as objects times the number of actions. So complexity and cognitive load grows at a very rapid rate. It does not grow linearly um, when the conceptual model is weak. Now, excluding my students and Jeff, um, how many of you are familiar with this as a guiding principle in UX? It's a small number. Okay, because I know who's a stu former student, okay? A point from my students, <laughs> and the rest of you in the room, this is one of the underlying, probably three, insights that led to the invention of the graphical user interface. In this very building that you are sitting in today, some 30 years ago, maybe longer, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, okay? And we have, for the most part, lost sight of this, both in practice and in academia. And that problem can be fixed. But it's very important that we are on t um, terra sancta when it comes to graphical user interface being here at Xerox Park. Another example, mini class here, <clears throat> is understanding how to measure, monitor, and tune user experiences for speed. If you look at our expectations, our expectations are very high, and no offense to anybody at Google here um, who's in the audience, but Google has set the expectation that search results come back instantly. But Google is a product. If Google misses a search result, what happens? Nobody dies. Nobody dies. Okay? If clinicaltrials.gov misses a search result, and you're, you're an oncologist and you're trying to find a clinical trial for a patient that doesn't respond to routine treatment, the patient could die. There are 20,000 unique parameters in a clinical trial search that are po could possibly exist and be handed off by an EMR and be queried of the doctor while they're trying to set up the search. It runs on IBM Watson. There aren't many faster computers in the world. It does not happen instantaneously, right? The same is true for banks, right? If Visa is going through the entire ledger of the billion transactions that happen today, and they miss a financial record, or your bank misses a financial record, somebody can go to jail. So while we have this, this need from our product lives, um, to feel like we should get immediate results, um, the real world of solutions cannot yet deliver at this level of speed. Therefore, there is a whole pedagogy um, going back quite a long time on how to deal with this from a UX standpoint, when to, how to do things to keep people informed, how to make software feel, fa software feel faster than it is, 
and how, even importantly, not to tune software that's already fast enough, which is an engineering economic mistake. You can't just say everything needs to be sub-second because it simply isn't true. The literature and work on this goes back, again, possibly 20 or 30 years. I was just chasing down an article of Jeff's from 1995 um, for uh, something I'm writing. Um, I don't know, how far back does it go? Probably 10 years before that? Okay, so 40 years ago. Because those systems, I mean, what the Alto ran on was not a lot of CPU, right? The first Mac was not a lot of CPU. I mean, you had to deal with these things. But this, again, is a lost art in the practice of UX. History lesson, deconstructionism. All technology-oriented designs go from the manually created designed world to an integrated world to an automated world. This is a um, diabetes example of a blood glucose meter that you would have to do with your hand. Um, prick your finger, put the uh, little tube in. That's the blue star screen. Well, I can, obviously, any meter can talk to um, any other tracking thing by Bluetooth. Um, that's not new. Does anybody know what the thing on the left is, the far stage right? That's a contact lens with a glucose sensor in it that Google is working on, um, one of their so-called moonshots. Microsoft funded this for a decade. Uh, it's done by a, it's a professor at the University of Washington and gave up on it, but Google decided to pick it up and continue it, and it might very well work. Um, I've done some work, and I know we have somebody um, here from Bigfoot Biomedical that's doing an artificial pancreas. So you basically body hack and for type 1 diabetes, comprised of an embedded meter and an insulin pump, and um, you run it from your phone. That's a solution. That makes a mistake. It's going to have a lot of consequences. <clears throat> Last topic, the scaling fallacy. And this is really a, an engineering lesson here <clears throat> that, <clears throat> and I, I take this from uh, a wonderful book um, called Principles of Design by Lidwell Holden and Butler, which also belongs in everybody's library. Flying for a, a seed or some pollen to fly and float through the air is not the same as a bird. It's not the same as human flight, right? Problems change at scale. They are not the same problem. And this, again, is something that I think is very poorly understood. It's a friend of mine <coughs> um, who worked at Boeing uh, in the uh, Human Factors Organization said they would put out ads for people who were transportation designers, and they'd get responses with people who would send beautiful portfolios of mountain bikes. And yes, the mountain bike is a form of transportation, but it's not at the scale of the cockpit of a 747. These are completely different problems, right? And so the lack of understanding, both at the academic level and the practice level, of the implications of scale are very important. But there is a significant number of orders of magnitude um, between the world of product, as I define it, and the world of solution. Now, it's interesting to look at scale, just to throw out some numbers, since I'm a former SAP guy. SAP, as recently as 2015, claimed that 70% of the global GDP is running through SAP every day, which is a staggering number. Um, but given the financial um, strength of the company, there might be some truth. Now, I did some research on this because I can challenge these numbers now that I'm no longer an SAP employee. And it turns out that you have to divide by 50%. You have to divide by half, at least, because less than half of the global GDP is digitized. A lot of it's still cash, in the, particularly in the second and third world countries, right? <clears throat> but even if it was 30%, that would seem like a rational number. So then I went hunting for, is there an instance where somebody can claim 30%? in terms of scale, and I actually found it, that um, Serbia, I found this article 
where they basically are claiming, who the, whoever the author is, that 30% of Serbia's GDP is generated by people using SAP. So maybe it's not so crazy that even one company could be operating at that level of scale. However, as I noted, um, scale is about completeness of solution. It's about getting the end-to-end -end thing to work. It's not about size, and that's why, I, as I said, I mentioned, I'm not going to repeat this, um, this particular instance of what you might think of as just a phone app. Um, <clears throat> but it's actually legally medicine. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Everybody can pause and take a deep breath, including me. And I realize I have plenty of time left. <clears throat> Okay, so let's, let's kind of bring this full circle. <clears throat> so my UX definition of deintellectualization is the process of dumbing down in education and practice of the profession typified by the popularity of non-specialist methods that attempt to institutionalize creativity into one-week workshops based on the false premise that intuition is a substitute for science knowledge of history, and craft. What do I think are the causes? I think, obviously, there's a lot of myths in the profession. I've just tried to debunk one. I talked about the myth of usability ROI <clears throat> from 15 years ago. I think there's poor awareness in the field about the actual macro dimensions uh, and that the world really aligns around this notion of products and services, that all products, I'm sorry, products and solutions, some of which of each could be considered services, and the economic and design characteristics and the scale characteristics of these different areas. Agile methods are optimized for building products. It is true that the FDA has an approved uh, guidance document on Agile, and it is probably more rigorous. But fundamentally, the try and fail and fail early, fail often culture of um, Silicon Valley and other, quote, world innovation centers is assuming the simple case. There are some contributing factors. The popular press is a problem. The Steve Jobs legacy itself is a problem. I've worked for many CEOs, including Larry Ellison and Philippe Kahn, um, who are relatively outspoken individuals. <clears throat> Larry did not think he was a designer. Actually, I got along fine with him. It was the executives at SAP I had trouble with. <clears throat> but this myth, again, that the CEO did it all himself, Right. Johnny Ives is an absolutely brilliant designer, um, and even in my dreams I wouldn't compare myself <clears throat> in skill level to, to him. Um, but there is this fallacy, you know, that all you got to do is talk a lot about design and be an asshole, and you're going to get this brilliant result. And that diminishes the significance of bringing a rigorous approach. Silicon Valley culture, which everybody tries to copy, whether you're in Austin, Boston, Tel Aviv, Pune, Bangalore, you name it, Helsinki, right? Failure is a badge of honor. Um, most doctors don't feel like if, you know, an operation was a success when the patient dies on the table. Oh, so now I'll try a different method next time, OK? Venture capital's funding model historically has made the situation worse, but it is getting better, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the whole cycle of product development and launch before funding, so if you're doing anything other than a medical product that would require FDA clearance, you're practically supposed to show up you know, on, on uh, Sand Hill Road with a finished product and at least 10 or 20,000 users, or you're not going to get any funding. So there is this extreme pressure um, there's a lack of understanding UX history and HCI history. 
in all the curriculums worldwide. Um, it doesn't matter. I have looked at all of our university's competitors in terms of proposing growth to the San Jose State um, Human Factors Program, and I know what people are doing, and I couldn't find a single history class. I think design thinking and Google Sprints, which are fundamentally non-specialist methodologies, have a tendency to be um, contributing factors because they also, like the popular press myth that er everyone's a designer, get into this collaborative, um, intuitive kind of model. And I have taught design thinking, and I have participated in several Google Sprints with clients. They have their times and places where you can use them appropriately. But as an overall pedagogy for teaching design, um, they're a joke. And the last one is MBAs and design strategy. Now, there are two variants of MBAs and design strategy. There's the variant like we see um, in the California College of the Arts program started by Nathan Shedroff, who is, in fact, a brilliant designer. And the MBA is given in a design school. We have on the left. On the right, we have a program like the Business School at Johns Hopkins giving MBAs in design strategy for people who've never designed a paper clip or a paper airplane, right? And then following the MBA track into the boardroom. So to me, it's a very double-edged sword. <clears throat> There's kind of a macro factor in society, which is always the quest for the silver bullet. So over my 40 years of practice, there's always been a silver bullet du jour. Um, when I was in the research labs at Eastman Kodak, it was Six Sigma. I'll skip ahead several decades. It became Agile, Lean, Design Thinking, Google Sprints. There will be something after Google Sprints. There's always an attempt to go faster and cheaper um, at the expense, in my opinion, of um, an intellectually sound approach. The other macro factor is that the internet amplifies, like no other invention, the noise. I love this particular one. Discover how to instantly improve your UX, right? Sign up with us. We're going to give you some clickstream metrics. You can get your data in five minutes, fix your UI in another 10, and you're in nirvana. Um, the internet also amplifies, in the context of UX, a tremendous amount of noise and a tremendous amount of misinformation. Um, the stuff that I see my students drag in off the internet um, is scary. And frankly, even though I admit to subscribing to Median to follow what's going on, 90% of the time, if I respond to a UX article on Median, I'm basically saying what you said is not legitimately grounded. Uh, there was one I responded to last week where a person was talking about their journey into UX and stated that there are no educational programs in the United States for UX other than taking the classes at the Nielsen Norman Group. And I said, gee, have you ever heard of Carnegie Mellon? Georgia Tech? Washington, University of Washington? Give me a break. This person didn't even name General Assembly. So I'm thinking, you know, if, and anybody can publish, so, you know, anybody is an oracle. Um, what is the antidote? The first piece of the antidote <coughs> is something that is very controversial within the profession, which is certification of interaction designers. Structural engineers need a license. Architects need a license. For anything other than your neighborhood pet store website, designers should have a regulated code of practice. Now, the Human Factors Engineering Society does have something like this, but it's not quite where it needs to be. <clears throat> but eventually, to separate um, from the um, real practitioners from the pretenders, um, we need some sort of mechanism. You would not go to a doctor who wasn't licensed. You wouldn't go to an attorney who wasn't licensed to practice. <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> every company should have a chief design officer position. And it should be not a 
ceremonial position, but a real position. And there should be a mainstream UX practitioner, it doesn't even have to be a designer, but a real UX practitioner to CEO career path. Um, <clears throat> when I've seen this happen, it's usually because the UX person took a detour through product management and went to business school, but that's okay too. Companies that have des really design literate leaders inherently do perform well according to Gartner and DataQuest and all those people who <coughs> study that thing. We need informed media coverage and even within our own UX publications there's a lot of garbage and noise and competition between too many different organizations like CHI and UPA and IXDA. Um, <coughs> Most importantly, we need improved education, which is basically my current focus, um, with a scientific pedagogy for teaching interaction design based on the premise that everything needs to start with a conceptual model. HCI history, include business and economics, specific training, at least at the graduate level, with multi-year projects that are at the solutions level of complexity and scale, and free, high-quality academic materials um, related to IXD. The scientific pedagogy thing is coming. Um, please look for a book called UX Magic around uh, the December time frame, which is a textbook I'm working on right now because I couldn't even teaching in seven years of interaction design um, find a source that I could use that was full spectrum. I do make my students um, read Jeff's books. So they do have to read conceptual models and design with the mind in mind, but there's a lot further we can go into the pattern layers and flow and UX architecture to push this um, concept forward. And then free high quality and essentially academic quality materials on IXD. That exists already um, to some degree at the Inter uh, Interaction Design Foundation, though it is still in need of significant improvement. Um, and we're working on that. But now when I talk about history and economics, again, in the practice, if everybody's honest, how many of you have read one of these books? The one on the left is Jonathan Gruden's History of Human-Computer Interaction. The one on the right is Irene Au's Design and Venture Capital. These books came out in the last two years. And they fill an important hole. And these are um, very important practitioners in the field um, whose names are well known. <clears throat> so again, I think it's incumbent on those of us in the practice to stay current. And it's incumbent on those of us in education to put these books on the reading list for our students and make sure there are questions on the final so they actually read them. <clears throat> I did already mention the Interaction Design Foundation. I hope you're familiar with it. Um, it is a nonprofit in Denmark with lots of courses and a huge encyclopedia. It's kind of like Wikipedia, except all the authors are experts in the field. There can be discussion on an article. You cannot edit Karen Holtzblatt's article on contextual inquiry. Okay, the dean has spoken, that's her position. <clears throat> and as I said, for full disclosure, I am a board member of that um, organization, so I do have a vested interest. However, I have not written any of the content that's on this site. Not the videos and not the encyclopedia, but that will probably change in about a year. So, <clears throat> I'm going to wrap it up. <clears throat> I fear, as a grandparent, <clears throat> that the world is going to end not because of an off by one error <laughs> in some operating system kernel programmer's code, but because of an error, a human error, within some type of solution that could have been prevented through competent UX practice, informed modern UX practice. The ability to save both the profession from itself and the world is in your hands right now. It's not about what I say. It's about what you guys do when you walk out of the door at the
the end of the evening. Thank you. <clears throat> if you would uh, indicate your interest in asking or en uh, questions or engaging in banter, lively banter with Dan. And tell me where I'm wrong. All right, Edwin. <laughs> <clears throat> Not where you're wrong, but uh, perhaps a bit of advice. Okay. Uh, would you suggest then that those of us who are perhaps more mm, cognitive, cognitive science oriented um, <coughs> for our own perhaps temperamental happiness seek positions in organizations that are more regulated like a medical uh, field or is it or would you see a responsibility to spread that uh, mindset more broadly? I think we need to <coughs> spread it as broadly as possible. I don't think we should say that the only place that deserves that kind of level of rigorous design is medical products. One of the interesting things about all of this, in my experience over the years, and as I said, I've run large UX teams, been responsible for products that make billions and billions of dollars every year, is that if you do this stuff right, the cost of engineering goes down. It doesn't really matter, you know, again, product or solution, <coughs> right? The better you do up front in terms of the research, the, co the conceptual model, the early design, and holding that and holding true to it, right, the more efficient um, and sustainable the business becomes. So I, I don't think we should um, give up on any turf. <coughs> Hi. Uh, as a veteran of uh, designing at both consumer and enterprise companies, I just wanted to make sure that I understand your point about th that the myth is that there's a difference right. between designing for consumer and designing for enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that there really that isn't really how we should be looking at it. It's more is it a product or a solution? Right. And, okay. Some products that Oracle makes or SAP makes are products. Some, some, let me, again, be careful with my language. Some things that Oracle or SAP or Salesforce, but mostly Oracle and SAP, charge money for are products. Some of them are solutions, right? When you use an enterprise, quote, company's product, to do um, international tax law and trade, it's a solution. When you do recipe management for the pharmaceutical industry, it's a solution. When you do marketing campaigns for customer relations, like in a sales force, it's product. They have very different characteristics. When a marketing campaign fails, somebody can lose their job, but nobody's going to die. So is, is that more clear? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this term science, um, I find a little bit confusing. I know about what an experiment is. I also know what an IRB is. I didn't hear anything about that in your discussion. Maybe only academics care about beneficence. But maybe you want to say a few words about um, you know, the difference between taking the gospel, as you said, somebody made on this, on this site, and experimentation, that is, you know, making sure mm -hmm. that these principles work in this situation, which is obviously of, 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 often okay. uh, a concept mm -hmm. of scale, as you might say. When I refer to the application of science, I'm referring particularly to using what is known in cognitive science in the work of creating designs. I am not a research expert although I am allowed to sign off on IRBs at the university for my grad students. There is tremendous weakness uh, in understanding, I would say, the science of measuring usability and understanding cause and effect um, that I see, even though, again, it's not my field. So, but I give you the classic example. 
is I have had consulting gigs with consumer companies like Realtor.com that went on for over like four years. <clears throat> if you take a dating website and you have a high drop-off rate of your users, is that good or bad? Right. This is the example I hoped you were going to come to. This what, is does, what, what, what does this mean from a, from a user research standpoint? Okay? It means that either people are getting married and you're being really good, or your service sucks. Okay? So I would say, at least on the research side, the substitution of um, clickstream metrics um, for real investigation of cause and effect in user research is a classic example of deintellectualization because anybody who's actually um, been trained in research knows that correlation does not imply causality. You have to go deeper. But that's probably the best answer I can, I can give you. But my, my concern is in teaching design, right? That it's not all, oh, the creatives just go but draw design, on the whiteboard. But design without evaluation is not design. Evaluation is central. Evaluation to is absolutely what central to design because the only place in the history of the human race where the doctrine of infallibility has been invoked is when in the, I believe it was the 14th century, I don't remember which pope, invoked the doctrine of infallibility for himself, introduced the concept, and no pope has ever called on the doctrine of infallibility from the Vatican to make a point about anything. So certainly the doctrine of infallibility does not apply to designers, right? No matter how many years, um, I am continuously embarrassed when my prototypes get usability test, right? Maybe I'm quicker to find it and fix it, but yeah, evaluation is critical. Um, but at the end, the other point though is at the very end of the cycle, you cannot evaluate your you cannot evaluate yourself to um, the highest quality design. It has to have the other side of the research equation before you go into the design that you're you're based on something that is known and understood. Okay. Other questions, Jeff? Just wait for the microphone since we're being recorded. Can people uh, stand who you are with your great information. <coughs> Jeff Johnson, University of San Francisco. So um, you just made a point that actually is one that I find it difficult to uh, impress on my students, which is the difference between, basically when, when I use the word user research, that can mean anything from upfront, you know, contextual analysis, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as uh, promulgated by Karen Holzblatt, all the way to testing the usability of a product before it goes out the door. Mm -hmm. And it's, I find in my own UX courses at USF that it's really hard to get my students to understand the difference <laughs> between those, those, those two mm -hmm. extremes and the, all the stuff mm -hmm. that's in the middle. Um, so do you, do you have any uh, mm -hmm. suggestions about that? In other words, it, it, as soon as they, <coughs> as soon as I bring up the point of let's, you need to talk to some users. <coughs> they, it, talking to users is the same whether you do it at the beginning, the end, the middle. No, it's quite cetera. different, and the techniques are quite different. I have a suggestion. <coughs> I did, I'm not sure that it maps to your program. When the majority of my thesis students do design projects, not research projects, right? So no hypothesis. And <coughs> I insist that for the first, practically the first semester, they play product manager, right? They have to take the business responsibility for the idea. They can't just say, I want to design an app for X and make it up. They have to go out and interview users or come up with a contextual inquiry study or some other thing to look at the problem space, right? <coughs> By the time you're in the, even doing a formative testing, of an early clickable prototype, you're in the solution space. You're already committed down a path, right? And it's a completely different thing. So what I do is I, I literally make them be product managers. And unfortunately, our program doesn't teach them to do that. So they get a lot of reading. Um, and that's the way we kick off. And that's a two semester activity. But they won't start designing anything until probably almost the end of this first semester. 
because they have to do all that other upfront work. And they do have to feasibility test the final prototype as well. But that's the only way. You have to feel it, right? And uh, frankly, it's dangerous to trust other people's information, right? <laughs> Keith. Great talk, Dad. I'd like you to expound upon why you think our discipline, and I agree with you, lacks history. I mean, I mm. remember back mm. when I was in graduate school, mm. books like McCormick and Chris Wickens' book talked about things of historical accuracy, like Chris Wickens' book once opened with a chapter on Three Mile Island disaster. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we've kind of dropped off from that? Well, Chris Wickens' book was really a mainstream human factors engineering book. And if you come from that pedagogy, you would have some familiar familiarity with it. We have the source material as a profession. Um, we just don't use it. Is my point. It's, we don't lack a history. We lack um, widespread knowledge of the history. And of course, <clears throat> for it's a difficult situation from a teaching perspective because at least like Jeff and I, we're teaching digital natives, right? It's different when all this technology was new and nobody knew what a cursor was, you know, and, and things like that. And so there's so much intuition that they bring into it from their experience as children that even the notion that there would be a material history that would be worth learning so you don't reinvent the wheel is foreign to um, the millennial generation and it's kind of incumbent upon the faculty, <laughs> if they themselves are not millennials, <laughs> to introduce it. Yeah, so my name is Edwin. Um, hi, I'm a UX designer. And one of the things, I, two, two questions. One is um, on the distinction between a solution and a product. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can sort of intuit that part of that distinction is a, a judgment on the level of criticality. Um, the degree to which, some, like you mentioned, you know, <coughs> someone might die. Uh, I don't, I suspect that is not the entirety of the definition. No, the, the real distinction from a macro perspective is the value proposition. Partial results yields partial value, right? As opposed to the full end-to-end -end thing has to be done for any value to accrue. Huh? To the value the yes, but let's take a, I'll take a, I just interjected, I'm sorry, I should interject. <laughs> that, you know, uh, if I am understanding correctly, a gun is a product, not a solution, because you can build guns of all yes. sorts of different kinds and whether they <coughs> work or not, but people will die based, based <coughs> on those. But So it's not <coughs> death, life and death that makes a difference, it's whether it's a system, it's whether it requires an infrastructure, whether, <coughs> whether uh, the whole thing has to, you know, work. If I invent a new gun, I don't have to invent the whole system of where, where do bullets come from, who, you know, et cetera. Right. I, I want to push this a little bit further with something that I think is an, it's kind of an intellectual brain teaser, and I have an opinion on, but I don't think anybody has the right answer. Is the internet a product, or is the internet a solution? How many of you would vote and say it's a product? Okay. How many of you would vote and say it's a solution? Okay. Those of you who would vote and say it's a product, why is it a product? Yes. Okay. So I'll repeat that. You can go on vacation without looking at the internet. So that's Anybody? why you think it's a product. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to venture why the internet is a product? Yeah. Okay. How about those who say it's a solution? What, what is the characteristic of the internet, the value prop that makes it a solution? Anybody? Well, I, Michael, I, Michael raised his hand. I'm going to repeat.
repeat Michael's comment that it will, I'll shorten it a little bit, that the bec it's a solution I because of the infrastructure and mm. all the pieces that have to come together. And Ted and Carola has a comment. We'll be back to you, don't worry. Carola and then Ted. I would say the assessment depends on what it is that you're trying to do with it. So for example, if I'm trying to get a hair clog out of my bathroom, which could be a health risk eventually, and I go onto a YouTube video and am able to figure out how to unclog my bathtub, it's, it's a solution. It's helped me do it that way. But if you're, I can't think of another, a product example, then it wouldn't be, so. Okay, I, will ar I would argue, I mean, you can vacillate on this, and it's a great topic to debate on about the third bottle of wine. <laughs> but I would say it's a product. And my logic for saying it's a product, or more, more product than a solution, is if you look at the mathematics and the invention of hypertext, all of the literature on hypertext said that links should be bidirectional. And on the internet, we have unidirectional links and a back button that's unreliable. Therefore, it's a partial implementation uh, in terms of mathematical correctness. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if you could dig in a little bit more on the deintellectualization. Um, it seemed like a lot of the examples came from education um, that you know, people write a lot about design thinking, mm -hmm. for, for example, or Google Sprints, and you see them on Medium posts, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, many of the ways that I've experienced it and seen people experience, uh, experience, let's say, a design sprint or design thinking workshop is sort of a one-time stunt, uh, is that, you know, you have your regular day job, and mm -hmm. then here, we're going to learn about design, and we're mm -hmm. going to, you know, do some initiative, and, you know, we're going to do this as a one-time thing, separate from how we actually do our work. Uh, and so I'm wondering if, if you know, if there's examples of deintellectualization in, in, you know, more in industrial settings of, of from the core process, because in some in some ways it, it seems like the trend is towards more more data because it's easier to get. Mm. And you know, going to the initial definition you gave mm. um, about deintellectualization with um, sort of contr using you know quant data as, as you know, um, what intellectual you know, design over means. Like there's, in yeah. some ways, there's, there's more of that out there today. Mm. And, and even from a qual perspective, <coughs> some, to some extent, it's easier to reach people. Um, and there might be more in interactions between people who are making things and people who are using things. Um, so I'm wondering you know, some kind of examples from uh, an industrial setting to illustrate this. I'll give you an example from the Google Design Sprint methodology that I find particularly offensive. Not the methodology itself, but just one little niche. So the official Google Design Sprint methodology has this bring your favorite app demo phase, where everybody brings an example of some app that they think is cool, right? <coughs> the suitability of any of the design patterns in that app to the domain at hand um, is treated as irrelevant. And the underlying assumption is that all new designs are just a mashup of, every th of, of what already exists, right? <clears throat> to me, that's a classic example of deintellectualization. That's saying that there will never be new precedent. Um, a number of probably contributing factors to the ACM award that Nancy mentioned were um, the invention of numerous design patterns that are, in fact, in common use today, um, ranging from the invention of tabs to the integrated development environment, workspace programming model, to a bunch of others. Those were new inventions at the time. And I would hope that long before my career is over, there would be lots of more inventions that don't have precedent. But if you start with this, oh, we're just going to do a little bit of Tinder and a little bit of Uber and a little bit of SAP, and we mash them together, and now we, we have you know, a solution to this inherent problem because we have one week to design and prototype and test an entire thing, it really um, bothers me greatly because, again, the idea that there would be new inventions and new paradigms that don't have precedent is what we need to kind of move the bar forward. And since we're at Xerox, I'll give you a very classic example. <laughs> um, 
those of you who are familiar with the history of the Xerox copier, it was invented by Chester Carlson. Um, we are at Xerox Park. You should read his biography. It's called Copies in a Minute. He was a very, very unusual man. Um, he was a patent attorney who happened to have a <coughs> bachelor's degree in physics from Caltech. There is no precedent in the history of science for storing the image on a piece of paper and reproducing it as electrons um, stored on a selenium photoreceptor belt. Right? There's physically no precedent. You can't go back to Einstein. You can't go back to Fermi. There's nothing. This was a complete, unique um, invention. And as long as we just say that in UX, everything's just a mashup of something that's been done and that we've experienced, and we embed that into um, the hyper-compressed schedule of the design thinking workshop or a Google Sprint, we're basically doing a disservice to the future. So that was a long answer to a short question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, my name's John Boykin. Um, I, I would just encourage you to come up with some term other than solution. Uh, okay. For 20 years, I've been urging clients not to use that word, to banish it from their vocabulary for the very reason that for 20 years, it's been difficult to find a company that does not claim to deliver solutions, whatever the hell that means, um, and no matter what they're doing. Um, and what, in practice, in, in my observation in the past 20 years, the term has been used as meaningless market speak. Um, marketing speak, um, and it would be difficult to go to a, uh, a trade show and walk up to somebody at <coughs> a booth and say, what does your company do without them using the word, well, we deliver solutions. Um, so I don't know what the other term is. Please come up with something. <laughs> I will take that as a challenge and see if I can come up with something better. But speaking of corporations, you know what the definition of a corporation is in the Urban Dictionary? A company that perpetuates the problem for which it claims it has the solution and can sell you. <laughs> yes. So that's why the dating app is a that has fewer users is a bad solution because it ruins their own business model. It doesn't know ruin their own business model. The point is, if the dating app has fewer users, you don't know that it has fewer users because people got married. But it's a bad app because then no it's one's using it anymore. Whether everyone's married, whether everyone hated it, you don't have users, so it's ruined. Or you so you're basically from, saying from it's from not a, a business perspective. So in theory, you could say it's not a sustainable business, but there are a lot of divorce attorneys that would disagree with you. <laughs> so I wanted to congratulate you on coming up with a book that introduces scientific rigor, and you're calling it UX Magic, mm -hmm. so that's a lovely title. Um, but I wanted to bring up, as far as the myth of enterprise versus consumer, uh, you talked about the size of the platform or the complexity of it. But when I've, whenever it's been used around me, it's really about the enterprise user being different from a normal consumer, that they're more motivated to learn it so you can take shortcuts, or they're in it every day so the, the expert level of the user is a lot higher than someone who, who's casually looking at it. I, I, would, I would also <coughs> say that this is not inherently correct. If you look at the enterprise workers and call centers around the world, I don't know about India and the Philippines, but in the US, the average turnover is 37 days for a call center worker. Yeah. So they are not motivated, <laughs> and they are not um, technologically sal savvy. They're probably more. Um, extreme than the typical consumer. But with a bring your own device to work policy that companies have, you are running company um, forced tools on your personal devices side by side with things that you have chosen to use, which if it was not acceptable to you, you would delete it and go back to the app store and find another alternative. And I think the way people are evaluating these things and this is a whole other topic in terms of UX strategy with the consumerization of IT in general and millennials making purchasing decisions. Um, 
it really um, pushes aside the fact that people in their lives can make a distinction. And it's not a distinction from, I used to go to work in that call center from 9 to 5, and then I'd go home, and maybe I'd you know, play games on, a, on Nintendo. It's side by side, minute by minute. You're using Oracle for 30 seconds, and you check your Facebook page. You're coming in and out of all of them at once. But there, I mean, there are plenty of reasons why working in a call center sucks that's not just related to the software. True. So I worked for, but they I worked for Walmart for years, and what the buyers had to go through to like mm -hmm. set up a new price or something, like they're putting it in our software, and then they're exporting to Excel, and then they're bringing it back in, re-exporting, <coughs> right? And these people mm. were not turning over every right. month and a half or something. The fact is that if you have a captive audience, you can survive with a lower level of usability, right? None of us like the California DMV <laughs> website, <laughs> right? But there's no place else to go, right? So if you have a captive audience, but on the other hand, if you have competition, you get wiped out pretty quickly if you don't reach some level of competent, if not brilliant, UX. Okay. One um, more? One. So you talked about um, the how design cycles have been getting faster and faster, and uh, they're supposed to be cheaper and cheaper, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> You know, iterate your product into into goodness. Um, so, there's a phrase in Silicon Valley that's become popular, which is "move fast and break things." So, one one of the things that that brings up is that something that is sort of inherently what you would call a product, let's say, the Uber app, for example. Um, I mean, th it's an, the Uber app is a product clearly, but one could actually regard Uber itself as more than a product because it impacts the city, right? That is, uh, uh, one of the things that's happened is because <coughs> since Uber and Lyft <coughs> came into San Francisco is that there, there was a promise that it would reduce the amount of traffic in the city because fewer people would have to drive and all these millennials wouldn't have to buy cars anymore. But in fact, the number of cars in San Francisco has gone up because all these people are driving in from Modesto to drive people around <laughs> in San Francisco, okay? So um, there are, I'll, I guess what I'm getting at is that these, something that looks like a product can be embedded in a larger system and can impact that whole system, sometimes in good ways and sometimes in adverse <coughs> ways. Um, and then it starts, the whole thing starts to look more like, I would use the word system rather it than. It is a system, it's not a solution. A uh, solution, yeah. Right, and as you pointed out with guns, Jeff, products can have negative consequences, right? No, no, technology, no technology is <coughs> neutral, right? And technology, whether it's product or, serv product or solution, have, can have social consequences. Right, even a product that works correctly, like a gun, where, as uh, I think Dan was bringing up examples where the product didn't work correctly, like Nest failing f because of a automatic update, right? So that's the case where the product, or whatever it is, uh, doesn't work correctly and people are harmed. And you're talking about the situation where the product does work correctly and people are harmed. Right. All right. Seeing no further hands raised, I'm going to declare this evening's meeting complete. You're welcome to come and address Dan, mix and mingle for the next half an hour or so. Let's thank Dan, and next month, <laughs> next month we invite you to join us here again, and our, one of our guests for sure is going to be Sid Harrell. You may know her as a civic designer. She ran. Uh, some big chunk of code for America for a couple years, and she's doing all kinds of new things, and we're going to get to hear about it. So come back again, second Tuesday of the month. <laughs>